when WCS started working in that park from in 2003, the goal was to conserve the large carnivores like tiger, leopard, clouded leopard, and their prey. And this was because this was a very unique area of Laos with these large carnivores still persisting. And one of the main problems there was the illegal hunting and trade of wildlife, especially those large carnivores. So when we started, we worked with the government of Lao there to kind of assess the situation of what was causing this problem. And we helped work with the government to design a couple of strategies to address the problem. The first one was a law enforcement strategy that was intended to reduce illegal hunting and trade. And then the second really important strategy was a conservation outreach strategy that was intended to help increase awareness and understanding of wildlife hunting regulations in communities living in and around the park. At the beginning, the expectation was that if um, our teams were able to provide technical and financial support to the national park, the assumption was that the park would be able to establish a totally protected zone where hunting would be prohibited, but there would still be um, potential for sustainable offtake of s specific species outside of that area. And then that law enforcement uh, within that totally protected zone would be initiated or deployed, and those patrol teams would be able to detect any illegal hunting uh, within the totally protected zone. And also there would be mobile teams to monitor for illegal trade of wildlife outside of the park. And um, so the intention was that if all that was put in place, that there would be an increase in detection of illegal activities, arrests, and ultimately prosecution to encourage people not to engage in illegal hunting and trade in the, in the park. Starting in 2005, once this law enforcement strategy was um, deployed, designed and deployed, um, there were a number of different variables that the team began to monitor. The team was monitoring law enforcement funding, how much financial support, technical support was going into this strategy. And then we also used a management information system called MIST, a computerized system which um, for the law enforcement was used to track both foot patrol and mobile patrol team effort, hours and uh, distances covered by these various teams. And then the result of that work, um, how that changed over time as far as warnings for illegal activity, uh, fines and arrests. And then the third type of monitoring was to look at change in wildlife populations over time. So we used periodic camera trapping, as well as looking at wildlife sign uh, to monitor relative abundance of large carnivores and their prey, as well as other wildlife within the totally protected zone over time. Every month, our law, the heads of our law enforcement teams, both the mobile teams, the patrol teams, uh, came into the park headquarters. And everybody met together at the park headquarters every month. And at that time, all of the law enforcement data was analyzed from the past month and added to the data that had been analyzed over time. And the law enforcement teams presented this data in a monthly meeting and this was a key opportunity for everyone to discuss the results what was happening with uh, trends in these different variables that we were monitoring why did we think those trends were occurring and then decisions were made about how to deploy the law enforcement teams in the next month given what was being observed and how much effort and spatial uh, deployment was needed to address problems that were being detected. And at the same time, this related to outreach, the 
the outreach strategy. And depending on where problems were occurring in the park, in and around the park, the outreach teams would also be responding to those problems. So it was not only law enforcement, but there was also outreach to communities uh, living in and around the park. So that monthly meeting was really critical. Yeah, so when we analyzed the data looking across the years from 2003 to 2012 over that time period, one of the uh, variables that we examined was human presence and trail use in the totally protected zone over time. And we could see that the trails within the totally protected zone, which had been heavily trafficked and used in the early years when WCS started working in the park, those trails had started, had grown over, over time, uh, given lack of human presence, which was a, a great indication of change over time. So that was consistent with leading into the information that we had about how prey populations were increasing in that section of the park over time. Our camera trapping indicated that the relative abundance of the prey species, the sambar deer, the wild pig, the moonshack, the sorrel, all had increased to varying degrees over that time period, which was a very uh, encouraging result that the law enforcement had, in, had been infected to varying degrees. Um, but we did see that the law enforcement effort was not sufficient to, to curtail the extirpation of tigers um, over time. Unfortunately, our law enforcement also detected that from 2009 to 2012, there was an incredible increase in illegal snaring of specifically large carnivores of tigers. There was targeted poaching of tigers in the totally protected zone. Our teams were uh, encountering more large metal snares, sites that have been set for tigers, and we started to see a decline in tiger sign in the park. And um, in conjunction with that, our camera trapping indicated that tigers had actually declined significantly from 2003 to 2012. So um, in that case, we found that this degree of law enforcement effort was not leading to sufficient prosecution of those that were involved in uh, illegal poaching of tigers, but it had been effective for increasing um, prey populations to some degree. It has shifted from large carnivores to much broader and, and possibly more about protecting biodiversity and especially the habitat um, around these areas. So, um, so things that are that I find familiar is the threats that Ali mentioned are still, you know, very similar with hunting being the predominant threat. You know, we're still getting sixty percent at least of our of our threats at the ranges are picking up in the field, or um, or hunting hunting related. You know, and then forest loss and habit uh, degradation is still a big threat around and inside the protected area. Um, what I do notice that have changed is the drivers around the deforestation and uh, forest degradation have changed quite a bit. You know, starting with upland rice, uh, when I got there, corn was becoming a really big problem within the protected areas, large areas cleared for, the, um, for, for growing corn. And that changed within a couple of years and now uh, cattle, uh, wild ranging cattle being you know, pushed into the, the core zone of the protected area is probably our largest uh, habitat uh, issue at the moment. So, um, so it's very interesting to see how the threats, while they remain the same, often the drivers uh, you know, change quite a bit during this time. Yeah. So our site-based protection, I think the main changes there was that we originally had, um, we had substations within certain sectors of the protected area and the teams worked from the different substations. And that was very good, but it was a very fixed form of protection. And um, at the end of the day, we've come to, I think, a pretty good compromise where we have certain areas where you need to have that 24 hours seven days a week protection, and then also the flexibility of having mobile teams that you can deploy based on what the data is showing, you know, where the threats are. And I, I, and I think that's a very good uh, mix that we've got now. 
in order to be able to apply good kind of adaptive management strategies. The ideal situation is to have a consistent level of law enforcement linked to a consistent level of repeatable monitoring. But we just we just have not had the funding to be able to do that. So we've had to focus you know, on protecting wildlife. So we still use, um, I think when Arlene was there, they used to use MIST, which is a very good spatial database. We, we're using the, the more updated version, which is called SMART, but it's basically the same, the same principle. And this is really good. It, it works excellently to cover all the indicators like really, you know, what are your patrol efforts? How, how effectively are the rangers uh, patrolling? What is the coverage of the rangers and what are the threats encounters? Where are they found? Um, the, the, the difference now though that we find is because we don't have uh, consistent levels of repeatable enforcement, it's very, very difficult to, um, to develop, to find the trends. To, in other words, to say, okay, what, you know, what threats are increasing in the landscape, what threats are decreasing in the landscape. So because of this fluctuation in the range of effort, it's difficult to be able to identify these trends across the landscape or across sectors or even across other protected areas. So that's the challenge that we offer. Um, we do now also use forest cover monitoring and we found that we use a very quick uh, method of uh, just comparing satellite data from one month to the other to identify the areas that have been cleared. And then we also use the fire mapping that's available through the MODIS fired um, app on the internet. And this provides us with like really good indications of where there's new land clearing or where there's new activities happening in the protected area so so this is it's not 100 percent like from a scientific point of view it's probably 80 percent accurate but it's definitely really works well as far as being able to inform the ranges of where we're suspecting to be uh, a land clearing so we use that a lot nowadays and then with our biodiversity monitoring this is the really challenging one because um, you know a lot of the species, it's very the densities within many of the protected areas in Laos, densities of prey predator population are extremely low, and in a large area of Namipaloi, which is almost five hundred thousand hectares, it's extremely difficult to get to be able to uh, do biodiversity monitoring that will actually show you what the trends are, and so we do do camera trap surveys. Um, when we get money, but again, it's not on a regular basis, it's very expensive, and so we just don't get the funding to be able to do that. Um, our smart data, the rangers collect uh, opportunistic data, which we uh, biodiversity data, which we obviously use. Our tourism sites probably have the more consistent data because they have certain small areas of where the tourists are, and they continually monitor what the visitors see and the camera traps around those areas. So. I mean, really, at the moment, it's a mixed bag of data. And, it, it, you know, it's using data, but it's also using a lot of educated guessing to, to try and establish and to try and develop adaptive management strategies. You know, with these limited budgets, obviously, you know, we have to take decisions here. We have to, we know that there are high levels of threat. But what we do is use this mixed bag of monitoring to the best of our ability. And that's the best that we can do at the moment, you know. The concern that I have, and this is the question that kind of keeps me awake at night, is that we often attribute this the, the success of smart um, data. So we look at you know these guns we've confiscated, these snares we've collected, the people that we've arrested. We look at these as results. So we say, oh, we're getting good results. But in actual fact, I think this is only evidence that we're collecting of a bigger problem. And so I think that our work is still very much cut out for us as to trying to get to the root of these problems. So yes, on a site-based level, we definitely have a positive impact, um, but on the broader scale within the landscape around the protected area and a lot of the drivers that are causing these threats, I think we still have a lot of work to do. And this is, this is really where I think we need to be investing in the future. Um, I think we've got our site-based protection, you know, really good. I think it's it's, it's excellent, um, but but uh, but I think with the areas, the with the drivers and identifying and solving the problems that are within the landscape that are causing this, I think there we still have a lot of work to do. The fact that we don't have the ideal monitoring or even law enforcement situation doesn't in any way minimize the critical importance of using the information that you have got 
to develop strategies and to apply adaptive management literally on a day, on almost on a daily basis. You know, this is absolutely important. It's so easy with enforcement to just keep repeating what you're doing, the same thing, the same month after month. And it is the most difficult thing to keep uh, to keep loose in your management and to say, okay, wait a minute, why are we doing this? Why are we still doing this? Why are the range of teams going out? Why is this particular range of teams going out? And, and the small data that you're getting in, the little bit of observation data you're getting in is really so important in informing, in making these informed decisions. The other thing that is absolutely key, and, and, and Olin actually mentioned that, is the, the monthly meeting. We hold a, a really good um, monthly uh, strategic planning meeting on Namapiloy. And um, I honestly think that this is the key to the, to, to the management on Namapiloy um, because it's actually a physical representation of an integrated approach to management. And, um, you know, at, the, at that meeting, you've got all the different components or representatives, as well as all different levels of management. So, so what we do is we, the, the rangers actually then deliver their patrol results. Our GIS person will actually put the rangers data on, the, on a map so that when, they, when they're feed, giving feedback on the patrol, you can actually see their track log, see where they actually got there, um, where they encountered the different threats and that. And, um, and so this is then discussed at this management meeting. And then the smart data is really valuable when your actual ranges are there analyzing the data. So when you put up a, uh, the graph that shows the, the threats over the last three months, they are very quick to be able to say, yeah, but the reason why that snaring is there because that was a new area we went in. Uh, when you've got a, this integrated kind of management meeting where all the different component levels are there, you might find that smart data might be showing that, well, there's an increase, let's say, of, of land clearing around a particular village, village area inside the protected area. So the temptation can be to say, oh, well, we need to send more ranger teams uh, into that area. But then by having all the different people there, you might have somebody that's actually doing the community engagement uh, to be able to say, yes, but the boundary demarcation in that village was never done properly. And so, yeah, they're always going to be, it's always going to be a problem until you solve the land use planning or else it could be that the outreach say, well, you know, there's actually a real need for outreach in that area or else the livelihood person, the person that really knows the communities there could say that there is a genuine poverty, you know, situation in that village. And the only way we're going to solve that is by, you know, providing some level of alternate livelihood. And so, you know, because of that, um, that kind of integrated approach, you start really being able to identify what are the actual issues there. And until you can identify what the real problem is, that you can throw as much as much enforcement at it as you want, you're never going to get a positive outcome. And so, and so, I think that that is the the kind of the real key to this management is those monthly strategic planning, a kind of an integrated management approach. I honestly don't believe in these kind of areas that there's one answer that will solve this problem. It's always going to be a kind of a complex. Um, a complex integration of a number of different activities until you're going to be able to see a positive result.